It's 9 a.m. Time for the only Garden Talk radio show in Milwaukee. Tell your friends, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is on the air. Join us and let's grow together. Coming up on the program, we're going to talk about mistakes we've made in our gardens so you don't have to make them. As well as dwarf trees. Is it right for you and what you need to know before you just go buy one? And horticultural expert, TV personality, all around a nice guy, William Moss. All that in your garden questions and our garden answers. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show is on the air and it starts right now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Some of the realest gardeners that you'll ever know. Always willing to share their knowledge, mistakes, and working to grow together. Founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com that contains over 1,100 garden videos to show and teach others to grow some of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they cover practical gardening information that has worked for them and more. Now here they are. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX106.5. Right here live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We are so happy you've joined us. You can join, you can find more information at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. It has all of our social media sites, uh, Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you're listening on the TuneIn app or the Simple Radio app or anywhere in between, we appreciate that. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Besides, is my best friend, co-host, gardening partner, and wife. Holly Baird. Uh, we, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com contains over 1,100 garden videos, short and long format, to help you grow better. Uh, you can watch, click on the Watch Us tab and it will drop down categorized. And each uh, week we add more. Uh, with the in-studio videos, podcasts of this program, as well as weekly garden videos, all to help you grow more. Well, there's a number of ways in which you can contact us today during the program. One is the Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Nat- Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, Ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com, or you can call into 414-444-5250. It's easy to apply as well. You can also tweet us at our Twitter handle is TWVG Show. You can also just hashtag TWVG, or if you want to sign up for our weekly email that comes out Monday mornings at 6 a.m. with everything we do, you can just tweet us at uh, tweet us at TWVG at 345-345. Well, we uh, have a number of talks this week. If you're wanting to come to a garden talk, this might be the week you can do that. Uh, We are going to be in uh, Germantown Monday, April 2nd, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. We're going to be talking on growing in straw bales. Uh, April 3rd, I've got a private garden talk at Waukesha uh, Courthouse. And then uh, that's not to the public, but for the public, it's April 3rd, Tuesday night, Growing the uh, Best Tomatoes. That's going to be in Brookville. And Wednesday, April 4th, 10 Ways to Maximize Your Garden Regardless of the Size. What time in Brookfield? Uh, Brookfield, we have it at um, 7 to 8 p.m. And then what's on Wednesday? Uh, North Shore Public Library from 6 to 7 p.m., April 4th, 10 Ways to Maximize Your Garden Regardless of the Size. So we've got a bunch of talks there coming up. Uh, we do want to make mention of a couple of the sponsors in our uh, lineup that you hear and will be hearing regularly. They have some great accomplishments that they have achieved. Uh, one is the Seating Square, current sponsor. Uh, the ad is running during the show. Uh, if you want to find out more, you just go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the radio tab, or just go to SeatingSquare.com. It's a one square. Uh, foot device that has holes that's designed for the square foot planting method. Right, and it helps you determine where to put the seeds. Right. It's color-coded. It's uh, really nice. Really nice. Uh, they are out of British Columbia, Canada, the B.C., and they auditioned for the Dragon's Den, which is the Canadian version of the Shark Tank here in the United States, and they got accepted to pitch it uh, on the show. So until that point, right now, it's t- uh, if you're up through April 10th, you can get 10% off and get free shipping by using coupon code 10OFF at checkout. Uh, it says April 10th, they'll be uh, getting free shipping and an extra 10% off on the orders when you go to seedingsquare.com. And then we have another one that uh, is coming up that will be, that ad will be, that sponsor will be running here in the next couple of weeks called the Tree Diaper. 
So the tree diaper is um, a plant hydration system. It's the first and only landscaping irrigation product to combine the functions of slow release irrigation, automatic refilling from rain weed control, and protect against extreme weather conditions. It basically, you put it on the base of your plant, it absorbs the water, and then it releases slowly into the ground. And they're going to be uh, on... They're going to be on... I want that. I want that. On the DIY network this Friday at 10 p.m. Central. So it's, it's very nice to see people, companies... These are family-owned small companies that are uh, supporting us, and they're making a debut nationally uh, through television uh, in different countries. So yeah, this Friday at um, 11 a.m. I don't know uh, if that's... Central, all right, at 10 a.m. Central time, 11 Eastern right. on the DIY network. So be really, it's really cool to see what they are accomplishing. Well, we're going to talk about some things that uh, we accomplished poorly last year or didn't accomplish at all that you do not have to do. The mistakes we made last year and years past in our garden because we don't want you to fail like we did. And some of these are things we already knew, but... Uh, just failed to work uh, to do them to do them correctly. So, um, what, you have to water your plants. Well, yeah, that and we talked about the the tree diaper. Uh, we are going to use dripping spring oyas uh, this year, as well as another device is the plant booster, which automatically waters your containers without electricity uh it does a phenomenal job there uh doing that so yeah it, it seems like common sense yeah you should water your plants well you know sometimes we forget and other things come up so it's one of those things and again not watering enough or watering too much that is also a problem in which uh you face especially in containers but yeah water regulate um, so, yeah, so that's one, especially I was going to say the containers as well. Right. We, we make um, lots of mistakes in the garden, and we want to share some of these uh, so you don't don't make them. I mean, how intense right. watering, but what are you going to do? So thinking about your soil, this was actually more or less Joey's mistake. Um, he was trying to feed the plants, and I said, you got to feed your soil. And then finally he realized that he was wrong. Well, in an agricultural standpoint, we talked about right. this a couple of weeks ago, you feed the plants, you, feed the you plants. supplement the, the fertilizer for the plants, and the, the soil is just a medium in which it grows. In. It, it's a dead, dead medium. So that was something, a transition in which I had to learn in an organic setting, in a backyard setting, rather than an agricultural setting. But, yeah, feed the soil and organic material, seed-free, chemical-free uh, grass clippings, your, uh, leaves, uh, we're finishing up cleaning up what leaves had fell on the property that I didn't get cleaned up this past fall. I did calculations. I, I, I like doing the math and figuring out precisely how much. Uh, we will, when it's all said and done, we'll have brought in over right at 2,000 pounds of unshredded leaves into our garden uh, since Oct uh, late September last year. Right. And that's just on our property, half a block on both sides of the, the house and half a block on both sides of the other side of the street. So I spent many days cleaning the street. I, I'm sure the city was trying to figure out why there was never any leaves on that <laughs> half of the street. I don't think they care. Yeah, because there was nothing ever there. They're probably just glad they didn't have to pick them up. No, I used clean leaves. I didn't use just yard debris. I left that alone because I didn't know what kind of toxicities other people were spraying on their, uh, gra uh, their grasses or their plants that they cut back. So it was just leaves that I brought in. Right. So the, the other one is um, not labeling your plants. We did this. A lot of seedlings all look the same. We did this with broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Oh, was one uh, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. Um, now we don't grow broccoli, but we do grow uh, many plants. So you want to make sure you know what you're growing. Right. Uh, we thought, you know, we, we thought we had tw uh, eight very nice Brussels sprout plants. Well, again, they weren't Brussels. Somehow either the seeds got mixed or I mislabeled, but we had very nice broccoli plants that we couldn't get to put a head on because we just can't make that accomplishment. On the other side of this, though, you have to keep in mind when you if you save your seeds to label those as well. Yes, uh, so you're not having a jar of mystery seeds that you're planting. Well, this is cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, or something because all the seeds are identical. Uh, so that's important when it comes to that. Uh, not enough weeding. This is something that if you do a square, if you do a raised bed or containers, really minimal amount of weeding, if any, just what seeds may fall from the sky. Uh, if you do uh, heavy mulching like we are doing with the leaves, we're expecting to have minimal uh, minimum weeds because the leaves are smothering out and preventing what seeds there to germinate. 
and what plant life is there is going to get smothered out because of the heavy amount of leaves that are on the, the garden already. Now, when I say 2,000 pounds of leaves, a ton of leaves, most of that by July or August, we won't even know we did a thing because that will all break down and feed the soil, just the natural process of the microbial life, worms, uh, other creepy crawly things breaking down those leaves now true if we would have shredded all of those leaves they would break down much much quicker but we don't have time to take a leaf mulcher and leaf mulch a half a block on both sides and 2,000 pounds of leaves we just get them dump them and use them as mulch and I'd much rather have the problem now hey I think I've got too many leaves than man I wish I had more leaves uh uh, this time of year. We just had a question. Yes. How do you weigh your leaves? I, I put it, we, we used a 44 gallon uh, rubber made trash can. I packed it full of leaves and I weighed it. And then I took an av- I did it a couple of times and took an average and then multiplied that by 72 trash can fulls, which is what I calculated because I'm very sp- precise of how much goes in. And so I know the end result. So that's how we calculated it. Yeah, I weighed a, a barrel full of leaves. Good job. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so not setting up a perennial bed. That was There's, something that we kind of look back and go, man, I wish we would have done that. Right. And, and if wishes uh, was uh, candies and nuts and everything, what is that saying? You don't, uh, okay. If, if, I know what you're talking yeah. about, but I don't know what the saying is. Which we... I know a different we, saying. We established the garden in 2010. And we didn't, you know, that was a time where things were kind of not really uh, financially stable for us. And we didn't know, are we going to be permanent here or are we going to be somewhere else? Mm-hmm. So we felt that on a year-by-year basis, we should just go with annuals, tomatoes, peppers, the things that we know that if we have to move. We did do strawberries, so We did do strawberries. But I think that was the following That was the year. only thing that we ever did. And now that I look back, uh, we, we do have rhubarb in containers. But I, I kind of wish we would have had uh, asparagus, some berry plants, uh, bushes, blackberries, raspberries, uh, that type of thing. But... That's something, if you are in a location in which you know you're going to be there long-term, you've put a 30-year mortgage on the house and you've got a yard, uh, two, to three years, two to three years, you can have a well-established Put that, plant. yeah, use, use those perennials to your advantage, that's for yes. sure. Uh, a, a plant that works for you that you don't have to work for it to produce. Um, another one is using Epsom salt for tomatoes. There's this rumor that if you get, Eps- if you get Blossom End Rot, you, if you put Epsom salt on your plants, it's going to prevent that, and that's not the case. Uh, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Now, we are all very lacking in magnesium intake in our diets, and there are some health uh, complications because if we have a lack of magnesium. But magnesium sulfate does not substitute for calcium deficiency in the soil that the tomato plant needs in order to develop the, the com- remaining portion of the bottom of the fruit. That's the black portion that the tomato develops uh, has because the calcium is not available for the full ripeness of the tomato. Your soil may be loaded with calcium, but it may be locked in the soil because the soil is too dry. So by watering the soil, keeping the soil damp, that will allow the moisture, allow the calcium to be picked up by the roots of the tomato plant and grow properly. So Epsom salt, not for blossom in rot. Uh, we've preached this for a, a number of years until we looked at the science of it and said, hey, whoa, we've made a mistake here. This is not the reason why it, do, it, it does what it does. So another, this isn't a mistake that we've necessarily made, but a lot of people do, is taking on too much. Um, I want to have a garden. We're going to do the whole backyard. It's 500 square feet. And then by July, you're like, you know, what the heck? I, I can't handle this. There's weeds everywhere. There's all of this. I can't do it. Right. And a lot of people will ask me, um, you know, you have this huge garden. I could never do that. And it's like, well, first of all, it's two of us doing it. We have a lot of experience. Um, and we started small. Right. We started with, well, and I, I, this is small, I guess, to some. Uh, we started with about 700 square feet. Then we went to 900. Then we said, okay, and, and it's at the Holly's mo- mother's back garden. And her initial quote was, I'm tired of cutting grass, turn the whole thing into a garden. Well, <laughs> Kind of. She wanted the main area, that one main area turn, and then you, you got, and you were like, oh, let me just open this up. That was that's what your famous line is. Let me just open this up a little bit. And, and now square feet later, and plus and, a few uh, raised beds and, and a dozen and a half containers. Right. Uh, we're out of room, and uh, that's that's yeah. But but t- I understood land management better because of that agricultural background that I had, uh, rather than you know you are uh, the, the I don't want to say average, but the hobbyist going into the backyard and going, till it all up, plant, and then I can't, this is too much, I can't deal with it. 
Um, so inside of that 1,800 square feet, we have what is called raised berms, where it's a two to four foot wide uh, area of growth space with a permanent walk path, growth space. So it's essentially like raised beds without the lumber, uh, that type of thing. So yeah, don't take on too much. Um, so uh, mistakes we may, uh, made in our garden uh, last year and in years past. So when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, oh, we're going to talk about dwarf fruit trees and what you can do because we have a dwarf fruit tree and maybe you want one in your uh, garden. Uh, we well, do have a caller. Let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in a uh, caller. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. Yes, you're on the air. Oh, thank you for your program. I just love it. It's wonderful. Now, let me tell you this to start off. I'm not really a gardener. But uh, I do have a house, and, of course, there's a lot of upkeep, and I like flowers and all of those things. But one thing I want to ask you about, I have a white birch tree. It's about five years old, and one of the, you know, I don't know, limbs, it's not called a limb. It's, I don't know the terminology for it, that, uh, you know, where the roots are that comes out. I, yes. Yes. I can't remember what it's called right now. I'm having an old age type thing. I can't forget I can't remember, but one died. Now, I bought this tree because I have three children, okay. and it was something that I bought with the tree because it symbolized my three kids that would live on forever. You know, you can see that I'm a little bit, but uh, I think like that. And I'm asking you, is there anything I can do? Because one uh, branch of it died, and I cut it back to see if it would regrow. Is there any possibility of that? Yeah, if if the if you cut one tr branch back, the dead branch, you may not get growth in that area, but you may stimulate growth in another area where it will put an offshoot and develop a new branch. Oh. So that is a possibility based on the tree. Trees and, and plant life want to survive, want to grow. So a lot of times when the city comes in and mows a tree down and they don't add a chemical to the stump, you'll get yeah. offshoots. And that's essentially what your tree may uh, potentially shoot off and put ah. another branch on. Maybe not in that area, but in a different area. Oh, in a different area. Yeah. Well, that would be all right. But uh, it's a good thing I didn't tell my kids that uh, that was a symbol for them. <laughs> <laughs> but I was quite disturbed about it anyway. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. And thank you for that. I do appreciate it. I have another. I had another question. Yeah, I can't go right remember ahead. It right. I can't remember it right now, so you guys keep on talking. Okay. And if I have a chance, I'll call you back, okay? All right. Okay, we thank you for calling. Uh, uh, thank so you guys for being there. do appreciate you guys. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, we're going to just dive right into the fruit tree portion because we've had some technical issues, so that gives us an opportunity to talk more about uh, growing fruit, uh, dwarf fruit trees. Now, so we have we have a dwarf uh, lime tree, right? I forget in the, the, kitchen, now. In the, in the kitchen. kitchen. It's in our kitchen, and we've had this thing for like what five years? Yeah, somehow it got shipped to us because we ordered seeds from a company, and somehow it got shipped, and we didn't order it. No, we did order. Did we order? It? Yeah, we ordered it, but it was like free. Okay. Okay, it we came free. So much it was like, yeah. Now, it came as a stick. It looked like you pulled a twig <laughs> out of the front yard. It, it, <laughs> there was nothing to it. It's called yeah. a bare root dwarf fruit tree. Right. Uh, um, so we, we planted it, and it grew. And then what we, we tried to do, the I think, was it the first two years? Yeah. I don't know, something like that. We would take it outside. Yeah, we took when it, it outside. Got warm out, yeah. And then we would bring it back in in the fall. Basically, once it got below, like, 60 degrees, we would bring it back in. Now, after about two and a half years, it started putting flowers on in, like, January, February, okay? So we didn't – at that point, we left it indoors because we tried taking it outside, and it just it, – the transition temperature was too much, and it dropped all those flowers. Now, uh, you do have to uh, pollinate your – hand pollinate your fruit trees, your dwarf fruit trees – the reason why it is a dwarf fruit tree is because the rootstock. The rootstock is a specific type of rootstock that is attached to the actual variety of fruit tree. And the rootstock allows the tree only to grow so tall. And usually three to five foot maybe is all that it allows it to do. Now, our tree is kind of, you know we have to rotate it every year towards the, the window because it grows towards the window. And we do have to hand pollinate. But it does put off about golf ball size type of fruits. On right, the, it puts out the limes. And the limes, um, yes. It's, it's nice. So um, it is possible to grow these things in containers. Many people think if you 
want a fruit tree, you have to commit a space in your yard for well, it. With these tropical dr- fruit trees, and, and you know, you can do apple, pear, and a pomegranate. Uh, there are some cold fig trees, uh, cold uh, type of fig trees. Uh, limes, lemons, those are all tropical you're going to have to do inside. But yes, you can do it in a large container, but you want to make sure that, one, if it is a, 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 veg, uh, a tree in which you can leave outdoors, that it needs those cold hours to uh, have a cycle on it, then it, you can put on a big container on your patio porch or deck. If it is a tropical tree, like ours is, you're going to have to leave it indoors, and you're going to have to have enough room indoors in order for that to grow. Right. And these have thorns on them now. They have about two to three inch thorns on the tree. So this is something you want to be aware of if you have children And around. it smells when it's blooming. It, not, not a bad smell. It's not a bad No, it kind of smells a little bit. You think it kind of has a bad smell? Yeah, remember? We always think it's the garbage and it's not. And the garbage is empty? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just so it does, But it's not, it's not long. It doesn't last long. It's really pretty when it blooms. Oh, yeah. It's just that it does... It smells a little funky. Yeah, for, for which well, now which tree do you choose? Fruit trees are good in pots as long as they are grown in a dwarf rootstock, like I talked about. Uh, any spe- uh, there's not really a specialty supply that you need. Now, you do have to get these from uh, uh, different locations online, and maybe some garden centers do have them available here. Um, but you can choose virtually anything that you would uh, – okay, virtually anything you would do. we got a couple yeah. callers um, here. So any, uh, virtually anything you want to grow, they have it in a dwarf variety stock. So let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead yes. with your question, caller. Yes, good morning. How good you morning. Doing? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your show. It's awesome. And um, I have some beds in my yard, and I changed over from regular dirt to organic dirt last year. Okay. And so I put my three to four inches of leaves on top of them in the fall. Now, can I go ahead and just put more organic dirt on top of those leaves? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. You're going to actually increase the breakdown process of the leaves because you're sandwiching them in between two layers of good organic material, and the microbial life is actually going to break down those uh, leaves even quicker. Oh, okay. Just like if you was to till them into a garden, so you're intercorpor- intermixing those leaves uh, in with uh, the soil. So, yes, absolutely. Okay. And then what is my chances of growing corn in the brown deer area? So you could you could try to grow corn. Corn does require a lot of nitrogen, so you would have to uh, boost your soil with some nitrogen. Nitrogen is that first number on the fertilizer bag. Uh, usually uh, when we dig corn in our garden, uh, we couldn't do it for years, and we finally we, we upped the fertilizer. I think it was 32, 27, 16, and we had phenomenal corn. So it takes a tremendous amount of nitrogen, but it is very, very uh, practical and uh, uh, possible that you can grow it. Um, however, you do have to grow it in a block. Yes. And you have to grow at least four plants, if not more. Preferably 16, per- 20. Yeah, preferably something like, 16, yeah. 20, and they have to be grown in a block so that they can pollinate because of how they pollinate. Okay. How, if you're looking for or, organic growing corn for a, a good price, Outpost always has it. Um, Outpost Natural Foods always has it. There's one in Mequon. They always have it in the late summer for a really good price. But oh, okay. but the the accomplishment of growing it yourself. Right. Growing, yeah, no, yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't yeah. try. But I'm just saying that if you are, if for whatever reason, if you're growing it because you want it, you know, cheaply or something, there there is places that you can get it cheap. Okay. Then my other thing would. Would would it grow in an area of say three feet by eighteen feet? Yes, yeah, three foot by eighteen foot. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. You'll yeah. have enough for about three rows there. Yeah, it will grow uh, there without any problem. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's go to line two. Ivy Organics three in one plant guard hotline caller. You are on the air. Oh yes, yes. I'm calling back again. I I found my notes. So. Okay. That I had, I have another tree, and it's one of those decorative trees that I call it my pom pom tree, okay. and it's dying. But there's still one area that's green. What are the possibilities that I can get this tree back up to par again, or should I just cut it down and go buy a new one? What do you think? How old is the tree again? Oh gosh, it's twenty something years old, maybe thirty. And so it's it's a pretty good sized tree. Oh uh, yeah. It, it reaches up to the top of my uh, um, garage. Okay. Not all the way up to the top, but, you know, where the door is, uh, where the roof starts. In the springtime, does it bl- blossom and, and put on leaves throughout the whole canopy or just part? Uh, no. No. 
uh-uh, just in one area. Okay. The tree's probably... Yeah, the tree is on its way down. You're, yeah. you're going to be more successful in removing it and planting new because you're not going to recover that oh. tr- that loss of that type of uh, uh, leaf oh. production. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's about to the end of its life cycle, and that's what's happening uh, okay. to it. Now, the other thing might be that it might be, the roots might be inhibited by some other underground, like it's getting crushed by concrete or mm-hmm. something of that nature. Okay. Uh, but it, if it's already only producing part of the leaves during the spring and summer, it's uh, best just to remove it and start fresh again. Oh, I see. Yeah. Now, I have some other evergreen uh, plants in the yard. They're, they're looking a little sad, too. They're just about as old as the one, the first one I was talking about. Yes. Uh, what should I do for them? Uh, what kind of fertilizer should I use? Or just tell me what to do because I'm going to have a party in my backyard. And uh, last year I sprayed pet green pay spray, pay spray on my tree just to have it looking decent for okay. my party. So that probably helped to get, well, to, to kill it also. But I didn't know what else to do and I didn't want to cut it down right. until that- I got some you know, questions answered. That paint uh, inhibited some of the photosynthesis because it, uh, you know, it's basically like you're covering over the leaves or the, mm-hmm. the needles. Mm-hmm. Um, you would want to do a higher nitrogen level for the trees. Um, let's hold that question. Let's take a break. Uh, we'll do right. some research, uh, okay. and then we'll answer it on the other side of the break. We can do that. Thank you. I appreciate the call. Uh, we're going to go to break, and then we'll come back, answer that, finish up the trees, and then William also will be with us. Thank you. 24-7-365, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com has all the gardening information you need, videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden. Find out more, visit bobex.com, B-O-B-B-E-X dot C-O-M. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need, from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cards, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Eco Garden Systems is a revolutionary way to grow food, a fully contained raised platform with a conventional watering system, solar power unit optional. Made from recycled material in the U.S., Eco Garden Systems raised garden bed offers sustainable, organic gardening that is environmentally sound, quick and easy to set up, maintain, and fun to use. Fill your garden with soil and plant your seeds. Your Eco Garden will take care of the rest. Can set up in backyard, patio, and even your driveway, any level surface. For more information, visit EcoGardenSystems.com. Use coupon code WIVEG125 to save $125 and get free shipping. A $250 value on the purchase of an Eco Garden Original Garden Unit available only in stone color. Purchases must be made to the website EcoGardenSystems.com forward slash store. Offer value through December 31st, 2018, available to the contiguous United States. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses, find out more at flameengineering.com. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at rootassassinshovel.com. One of the world's poisonous gardens that you can visit? This garden fun fact is sponsored by ManureTea.com. Get your three-pack today. Drop the tea bag in water, let steep, then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at ManureTea.com. Always free shipping. There is a garden in England called the Poison Garden. It is home to 100 murderous plants. Visitors to this dangerous garden are prohibited from smelling touching or even tasting any of these plants. 
Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mills is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bobex, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Looking for the only Garden Talk radio show on your dial? You found it. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Gardener radio show, thank you for tuning in on this dreary, rainy, cold Saturday morning here in Milwaukee. Wherever you else might be listening, it might be prettier, uh, but it's not here. Uh, Holly, we had a question before we went to break about fertilizing evergreen trees and how do we do that? So you're going to fertilize them in early April, so right now it's good. You, What you do is you're going to go to your local garden center like Blue Mills and you're going to ask for an uh, evergreen fertilizer mix. It has a, They need a little bit more acid and it has a great mix. More um, acidity. More acidity. So just finding a mix from your local garden center is what you want. And then you're going to dig little holes around the plant or the tree, and then you're going to drop the fertilizer in there, water in well, and right. it should do its thing. Now, that's if the tree is still viable because right. of, of that. Well, Blue Mills, you speak of Blue Mills. I was over there yesterday, uh, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, and they were getting geared up. Uh, John and Mike and Rachel and the team over there were getting ready for the garden season. They were starting to get products in. Uh, they have a knowledgeable staff. They have products that if they wouldn't use in their own garden, they wouldn't want to use, have you use in yours. Um, they've got the coffee shop. The coffee shop was packed yesterday morning. Uh, you can just go in there and get coffee, uh, danishes. Uh, they got all kinds of uh, <clears throat> snacks and, and, I guess, brunch items, I guess would be what you call yeah, it. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, so that was packed. So uh, if you want to go over and check out the coffee shop, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center, is at 4930 West Loomis Road, just south of Layton. You can call uh, 414-282-4220 or, of course, visit bluemels.com. They got, and they, ins- they do landscape consultation. They'll mow your grass. They al- actually install playgrounds throughout the city. They've installed over 300 playgrounds with that rubber like m- m- mesh underneath it so the kids don't get hurt. Well, Holly, let's go to the IB Organics 3 one Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our guest. And... Uh, w- as we find the right paperwork uh, for the... Anyway, William Moss is a horticultural expert and TV personality from the Chicago area. He is known worldwide for his expertise. Welcome to the program, William Moss. Hello, guys. How you doing? Doing well. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join Holly, myself, and all of our listeners and to share some of your garden knowledge with all of us. Well, thank thank you so much. I'm actually right now teaching a a garden walk about bulb at the Chicago Botanic Garden. So I told the guys, give me 15 minutes while I uh, while I chat with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions we have is that a lot of people, you know, they start their seeds indoors, but they want to just they just take them right outside and they don't go through the process of what's called hardening off. What is right. that process? How do you do it successfully? And what is the biggest mistake people make when trying to just Harden plants off wrong. Well, this is hilarious because I'm going through this right now with the school out in Lau, uh, Lau Junior High School, working with Sharon, Jessica, and Kelly. And what we're doing is we, we started a whole bunch of seeds inside, a bunch of cold weather crops that should be able to take these temperatures. But we know because they've been indoors that we've got to harden them off. Doesn't matter even if it's if it's cold hardy, if it's been indoors, you can't just throw it outside. So the, the best way to do it. The best way to do the process is to do it slowly. So hardening off basically means you're sitting the plants outside 
every day to get them adjusted to outdoor temperatures. You want to start by doing it when it's warm, during the warmer parts of the day. So, you know, midday, if you can get it between 11 and 12 or you know, sometime like that, that'd be great for one hour. So the first day is one hour, second day is two hours, third day, three hours, and so on. You build up until you can get them where they can be outside at night. And you'll be able to tell that you're rushing too fast because the plants will react by either shrinking down or changing color or just showing you that they're not happy. It, 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 and the, the main mistake is going too fast, which I did. I Yes, William Moss, the garden boss, makes a lot of mistakes too. And in my, and in my rush to get, to get plants set out at the school, I actually said, let's go ahead and put them out. We'll see what happens. Well, they've been hardening off for four days. That wasn't enough. We got those cold temperatures last week, and boom, all of them are gone. So, you know, you don't want to do that. You put too much time and energy and effort into growing the seedlings just to cast them out now. Take your time with them, treat them slow, harden them off a little bit, an extra hour every day, and then you'll be sure to uh, have them survive. Well, you know, we've talked to Shauna Coronado, we've talked to Joe Lampo, and now William Moss has proven that you can't be a good gardener unless you killed about 1,000 plants. So we're all in that category together, William, so that's... Uh Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got you got a thousand. A thousand is just to get started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, everyone is anxious to get in the garden, uh, maybe not today, but how do you know when the right time is to turn the soil over and kind of start getting things going? Now, I'm fine with people turning the soil over any, even when it's cold. The main thing you want to do is don't turn it over when it's wet. So on a day like today when it's kind of wet and gross here in Chicago, you don't want to be out turning the soil over because what you'll do is you'll compact it You'll press a lot of air out of it, and it won't be as as uh, good for growing vegetables as you need it to be. So what you want to do instead is wait till you have a nice dry day. Soil's been dry for a couple of days. You can go out, you can start turning it over, you can start adding your compost and all your amendments now. I hope your amendments include, like, compost and slow-release fertilizer. That's the best thing to do for them. Uh, turn it over then, and then and, and then it'll be ready for springtime. And the, ready to plant but you don't want to touch it at all when the soil is wet that's the big mistake people make well that's that's the thing because whenever you decide if you do the wet procedure you're going to have giant clods that are not going to be able the roots aren't going to be able to grow in very well Uh, right so uh, people often want to save seeds and how can people start planting now for their garden in order to properly save seeds in late summer and fall? It's not just a, hey, I'm going to do it tomorrow type of thing. There's some pr- procedures that have to go in place here. Exactly. If, if you want to save seeds, you need to know what you start with first. Everything has to be very well labeled. And secondly, you need to make sure that what you're trying to save isn't near anything that can mess it up. Like if I'm trying to save, there's a particular tomato I like called, called Super Snow White, and I'm trying to grow one that's acclimated to like contain our rooftop conditions here in Chicago. So to make sure that I'm getting the pure seed from that every time, I keep it separate from other tomatoes. So you need to so you need to label label well first, and second of all, have a good plan where what you're trying to save is isolated, or at least there aren't any things around it that can mess it up. This also happens a lot with like mustard seeds. If you're growing Asian mustards, European mustards, or broccoli or things like that, keep them separate from others because when they mix together it forms something completely different that you may not want or may not have the same flavor or taste. Like with wasabi arugula, I keep that separate from my other types of wild arugulas because, because if they mix, then the offspring won't have that same bite that the wasabi arugula does. So if you're trying to save particular seeds, remember, label, have a plan to keep it where you want it, and make sure that, that if there are any cross, make sure it can't cross, but if it does cross, then know that seed is not going to be the same as what you want. Okay, now there are different types of mulches to use for edibles and non-edibles. What mulches should be avoided even though they're commercially available? I don't like to use any sort of of wood-based bark in my vegetable garden because when they decompose, they require nitrogen. So so they pull nitrogen from my soil. I don't want my plants competing with my mulch for nitrogen. So I like to use things that are already fully composted so they're done with that process and all they're doing it's improving the soil by adding nutrients, improving the texture, uh, feeding, feeding the wildlife like the bacteria and the protozoa and the worms and things that are in there. So if, so if possible, make sure that it is well composted manure, uh, excuse me, manure, compost, shredded leaves, things like that. Not anything that looks fresh or like that. You don't want to put like, like fresh looking, like this tree was just chipped up and are you going to throw it down? That's a huge loss of nitrogen for your soil. 
So try to avoid those. Also, anything that has commercial dyes. If you're trying to be organic, having anything with a commercial dye, whether it's black, brown, yellow, red, all that stuff, uh, is not great for you. And, yes, I know I've advised many people that you can improve your tomato harvest with red mulch. You can increase about the 20%. Um, but then you got to weigh the odds on that. Do you want do you want to add, have the chemicals in there or not? So if you're trying to be one who's completely um, sustainable and trying to avoid chemicals and avoid those colored mulches too. But, but wood chip mulches, I think, should not be in any vegetable garden unless you uh, know and have accounted for the loss of nitrogen. Well, a lot of cities. Go, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. A lot of cities have free or cheap compost available, but like you know, William, free doesn't always mean good. What is some advice you give people who want to get that municipal uh, free resource or minimum cost resource uh, to to put in their garden? Man, you you are not kidding. Free does not always mean good, <laughs> and a lot of times that free stuff is whatever was on the curb. They just take it from people, and then they compost it, and they, and they offer it for free. That can be wonderful when it comes to, like, ornamental plantings or if you're putting it around trees in the parkway and things like that. But when it comes to your vegetable garden, once again, you got to be careful. Is it fresh? That means, I mean, is it, is it already decomposed? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. What's in it? If you start sifting through there and you're finding, like, candy wrappers or, you know, uh, paint wrappers or, like, uh, you know, rug carpet fibers and things like that, then you know that, that you know that it's something that that could be transmitting, um, you know, chemicals or, or bad stuff to your garden in some kind of way. So you know, I take the free mulch and I also use it, but I use it around things that aren't for my edible garden. Um, I don't want to discourage people though, and if, if you if you see it and it fine looks good, if you kind of sift through it yourself and it looks like you know there's no debris, no garden, no trash, no no anything like that in there, then it's perfectly fine to use and acceptable. But, you know, um, I like to know exactly where my mulch comes from and exactly the content of it before I put it in my vegetable garden. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Uh, you know. uh, okay, great. Because if, if, if people have late blight on their tomatoes, they throw it in the municipal recycle or compost, that those spores stay warm enough over the composting process, and then you or I go pick it up and introduce it in our garden, we've now got late blight far earlier in the season because those spores have never died off because they were never cold enough. Yes, de- definitely. And, and besides spreading disease and pathogens, it also spreads a lot of weeds. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons I have I had nutsedge in one of my gardens was because I was using free compost, and the compost was full of nutsedge. And as you know, once you get some nutsedge, it's hard to get rid of. That's also a way that, that thistle can travel that way. Uh, so, so just be, be very careful of it. Screen it carefully and maybe do it in a test area, like in an ornamental patch first, and then you can kind of know what may or may not be in there. That's definitely some good advice. Now, there's so many gardening books out there. What are two great resources that you use, whether they be books or online resources? What are some great resources that you would recommend for all gardeners? Well, I would I would be remiss if I did not mention my own book, Any Size, Anywhere, Edible Gardening. Uh, that is put together for people uh, who may have small spaces or gardening containers or patios, either by choice or by necessity. So that that's a really good one. Um, for those circumstances. And then when it comes for, for me, when I'm looking up resources, I like to go to uh, either University of Wisconsin's page or University of Illinois. Both of them have extensive garden programs. Uh, they know what they're talking about when it comes to soils and all of that. So I use the university resources a lot. I mean, that, that's not an exciting answer, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm, from a, I'm from an academic background, and I really trust those guys because I know they're always going to present the best information, and you know, when they get it wrong, if they've got it wrong in the past, they're going to correct it right away. Yeah, anything with a uh, ed- uh, university extension uh, website address usually has 100 they They've gone through and they've done all the trials and effort, and yes, this works, or no, it doesn't. Here's the reasons why yes. scientifically, and that's a great source to go to. Go, uh, for, to. Yes. So, sure. William, we, we appreciate your time. But where can people find more information about you and get, that, and get your book? Where, where can we go for that? Well, the book you can go uh, any, any site, Barnes and Nobles, Walmart is even carrying it now. Lowe's has it. Lots of places you can go look for any size, anywhere, edible gardening. The name is William Moss. Also, you can reach me on Facebook. Well, I love to see your stories, Holly. You make me laugh at least at least two, <laughs> three times a week. I'm laughing at your stories. Oh, good. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, so definitely you can reach me on Facebook at William Moss or William Moss TV. And my website right now, I just put up some new stuff about spring. I got my Mossy Awards for the 
best plants of last year at getoutandgrow.org. Well, William, we greatly appreciate your knowledge, taking time to spend with Holly and myself and our listeners, and go back and educate some more people about gardening and get them out and grow some food. That's what I want to do. That's what I do. And you guys have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you soon. Clearly. Thank you. And we'll be right back after Just this. Just tuning in, here's what you missed. We all make mistakes in the garden. We want to share some of ours so you don't have to make them. Don't forget to water your plants. Yes, it's happened to us. We didn't feed the soil. We tried to feed the plants. Good soil is the key to the garden. Door fruit trees. You can get about any kind of large tree as a door tree, but if you keep them indoors, you will have to hand pollinate them. Do you, do you have the space? They can take over a room. Up next, horticultural expert and our good friend, William Moss. For full shows and highlights, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Got a question? Email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible. Harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccessOrganics.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at TheGardener'sHollowLeg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunks. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear in all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Wouldn't you love to get more from your growing space? By utilizing the square foot garden method and properly spacing your plants, Seeding Square will optimize and organize your veggie garden to grow more greens and less weeds. The square foot color-coded seed spacer is a great tool for any garden, ground, container, or raised bed, and all experience levels, even little green thumbs. For more information, visit SeedingSquare.com. Seeding Square is gardening made simple. Keep your garden growing and your grass green with a Chapin G362D Professional Hose and Sprayer. Easily fertilize your lawn and garden and control pests. Just fill the tank with solution, select the mixing ratio, attach a garden hose, and spray. One 32-ounce tank will spray up to 362 gallons of diluted concentrate. Find online or order through Lowe's Home Depot. Do it best hardware. See the full line of Chapin products at www.chapinmfg.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscaping Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. 
now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey Halle Berry. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and FM 106.5 in the city of Milwaukee. Let's go to line one of the Ivy Organics 3 one Plant Garden Hotline. For a caller, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. It's in regards to wheat. Yes. Uh, uh, I had a slab put in my backyard to support a fountain. It was so heavy they had to lay concrete to uh, stabilize it. And the dirt they took from that area and put on the other side of my uh, yard uh, grew a lot of weeds, and I wasn't able to pull them out uh, the year after. And now they're dead, and I would like to plant uh, some flowers or maybe even grass in that area. What can I do? What kind of products do I need to uh, uh, take care of that? What you could do is you could take some black, um, you could just take black plastic, black garbage bags, mm-hmm. and cover that area now. Mm-hmm. And then as it warms up, it'll bake those weeds oh. and kill them. Yeah, the, the, and s- then oh. the soil will warm up because of that uh, radiation and t- terminate the germination of those weed seeds that are viable in the soil. And then come later on the spring, you'll, you should be able to, like closer to Memorial Day, you should be able to plant flowers or grass or whatnot there. Oh, thank you for mm-hmm. that. I am so glad I called back. I'm yeah. so sorry to keep double dipping, but yeah. I need a lot of help. Thank you so much. <laughs> I do appreciate it. That's no problem. Fine. Okay, thank have you. a good day. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's not going to kill, I mean, what you're going to basically bake the soil but you're going to be able to get the viability and the nutrients and the microbial life back once you start watering it and, and putting, you know, nutrients in. Uh, can you help me with, uh, with uh, can you help me this year? I start seeds, uh, seedlings in peat pellets because it's a very easy way to go about it, but a few weeks later the plants look droopy and sad. What's going wrong? Which we've addressed this on the program, but I want to bring it up again because we're all in this uh, time frame. So expand, expandable peat pellets are those little, uh, little peat, peat pellets, and they expand when you add water and then they're good for starting seedlings however it's just peat moss you're growing and that has zero nutrients so after a couple of weeks you're going to have to add some sort of fertilizer liquid usually to that to add some nutrients to those peat pellets yes uh one more question here i heard uh you mentioned about baking your soil how does one do this and will it kill the nutrients in the soil uh you want to bake your soil and it's best if you just get a seedless mix but you at 200 degrees uh, moistened the soil and, and until the internal temperature gets to 180, and it will. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVOrganics.com 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414 444. Five two five zero. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Are you short on time when it comes to grocery shopping? Yes, I'm talking to you. Shopwoodmans.com offers online shopping for store pickup or delivery on their over 60,000 plus items at Woodman's Everyday Low Prices. Or online, select a pickup or delivery time and create more time to do what you want. Leave the work to Woodman's. Also, check out the Shopwoodman's.com app. You can even make specialist requests like specific sizes of produce. For more information, visit shopwoodmans.com. Boss Tools wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And their precision garden seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Haas Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at ZazProducts.com. 
Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. An Oya is an unglazed, porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through drippingspringsoyas.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. Here at Outpost Natural Foods, it's not just that we're community-owned that sets us apart. It's the fabulous foods we sell. We celebrate Earth Day every day by offering our customers the finest natural and organic food selections in greater Milwaukee. Outpost local farmers and vendors provide our stores with a delicious selection of fresh seasonal produce that you won't want to miss. Outpost stores are located in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, Bayview, and Mequon. We're a real Milwaukee original where anyone can shop and anyone can join. For the whole scoop about Outpost, we invite you to visit www.outpost.coop. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. All right, time for a few more questions before we're out of here for the day. I have had in the past couple of years, ants would eat my strawberries just as they're getting ripe. What can I do to fix this problem? So there's a few reasons for this. One is ants like the sweetness of the strawberries. Also, aphids will go on to the sweetness of the strawberries, and the ants want to eat them. So that's two reasons why. So you can wrap something like double-sided tape around the stems near the base of the strawberry plants. To me, that seems a little putsy to do, especially if you got an out-of-control strawberry. But you like got more do. than one. Right. Um, otherwise, you can take diametaceous earth. Ants do not like diametaceous earth. And they will not they will not go by those strawberries. It's a natural product. It's a natural product. It's found in nature. Yeah. And um, it's ground it's volcanic uh, fossils ground right. up. Yeah. So there's many uses for that and here's one for ants. Um, if you know where the ant nest is and you don't feel bad killing them, you could Add boiling water, apple cider vinegar directly to the ant nest. Uh, boil also, you can boil uh, citrus uh, peels in that. That uh, cit- citrus oil, they uh, that will kill them. Then you can also make a tea, herbal tea repellent using something potent such as sage, peppermint, um, catmint. Um, what's the other one? Creeping Charlie has the same the same properties. What you do is you boil it and put it in a spray bottle, and then you mix one teaspoon of liquid castile soap, and then you spray your plants to repel the ants. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Yeah, and that's 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 a number of things you can do. In if order. you overwater them, that could be a problem too, because they if they start rotting, then they want those plants. Right, as soon as the fruit starts biodegrading, mm-hmm. the plants go. Uh, yeah. Uh, what would you, uh, Wanda, would like to know? I'm trying to find out if you can plant potatoes, cabbages close to one another, and if there is any positive or negative effects to that. Well, that's con- companion planting, and there's no scientific proof that any of this really works. There's no university study that shows that, hey, if you do plant this next to this, this is the end result. Now, there are some benefits to planting certain plants next to one another that it masks the this the odor, the fragrance of one plant, or um, hides it from unwanted pests. That mm-hmm. that is effective. That is sciencely proved. Um, so we. Uh, what you can do is cabbage is found to be a good companion plant to potatoes because it is a different plant in a different plant family. That's also a benefit that you don't put the same families together. Right. So then this is good because they don't share typically the same diseases or problems. Or attract the same pests. Or, yeah, that too. So yeah, they are they are friends. You can plant them together. Um, I have 
a question about my beets, how I found this container, how far does this, how deep does the soil need to be to plant in the beets? Six inches is minimum. Keep in mind, the less amount of soil you have in that container, the quicker it's going to dry out. So if you can get eight, 12, 15 inches of soil in it, that's a larger mass of material that's going to dry out a lot slower. So you always want to keep that in mind. And then we had a question coming in regards to... Uh, um, they want to grow lavender, basil, thyme, parsley, lemongrass, five small flower pots, uh, one of each at my kitchen window, or my breakfast bar with LEDs. How can I... What, what, what kind of LED should I use? Well, the Happy Leaf LED is the one that we would recommend. They have a what they call a garden in a box where mm -hmm. it, it will... So, it's a four inch LED light that you can plug into the wall or you can put on hook on your USB port on your computer and that works very very well uh, you can also get the 17 or 33 inch lights uh, they have available and if you use the coupon code WVG at checkout that's going to save you five percent on orders over fifty dollars they are a sponsor of our video series and they have sponsored and will be sponsoring some more segments here on the radio program but Happy Leaf LED, look at what the, they have to offer. The owner is an engineer and understands how the spectrums of light works and how it works with development of plants. And they're plants. not unsightly. There's something that looks decent that would be good at your breakfast bar. Well, that will wrap it up for us for today. Programming note, join us next week when we're going to discuss plants that don't need full sun to grow. So if you've got a backyard, partial shade, we're going to go over plants that will work for you as well as don't burn yourself out, something that many gardeners uh, uh, have happened to them over and over again, year after year. And we have guest author, um, great gardener lady, Mary Shire. Will be with us. She's uh, got a nice book that has just came out. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can find it under the radio tab at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Want to look for a specific topic or individual interview, you can find that on the right-hand side under the highlight tab. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You have been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Tell a friend and join Joy and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcasting, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.